Hello, welcome back to the Jerusalem Science Contest. This is our second week, and today we'll be looking at chapters three and four in your Chase and McMillan text. And these are the chapters having to do with uh, radiation, chapter three, and chapter four uh, is uh, spectroscopy, which is very, very important. So that's what we're gonna be uh, spending uh, quite a bit of time talking about today. So we're gonna begin with a discussion of radiation in chapter three. Uh, having to do with the electromagnetic spectrum. And from the time that Hashem spoke and the universe was created, uh, there was a lot of electromagnetic radiation being produced in the universe. So if we were to look at the entire uh, electromagnetic spectrum, we would find that it, um, it has a, a very, very large, uh, large range in terms of the sizes of waves and um, um, the, uh, what we call the wavelength of the waves. So there are waves that are many, many meters long, which are called radio waves at one end of the spectrum. And then there are other waves that are extraordinarily small and actually go down to subatomic sizes at the other end of the electromagnetic spectrum. So let me get my pen here and we can look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So we've got big waves, waves that are, and the waves look like this. And then this is at one end of the spectrum. And then at the other end of the spectrum, well, I can't even draw this, of course, because there's no way I could make the waves that small. But we have waves that are much closer together. What we're actually looking at when we talk about wavelength, the length of the waves, is the distance from here to here, from one uh, crest of a wave to the next crest. crest. We could also measure that from a trough to a trough. It would be the same distance. But that's called the uh, length of the wave. There's one other thing that we have uh, that we can talk about in waves, and that is the amplitude of the wave. So waves of electromagnetic uh, energy actually propagate in what we call a, a sine function. So this is what we call a sine wave. So they go up and down regularly. Uh, if you're going from uh, zero degrees to um, then you go to 90 degrees and 180 degrees and 270 and 360 degrees, you return to uh, the point where you originally started. So this would be a sine wave, and the distance from here to here is what we call the amplitude of the wave. So we've got this is the wavelength, it's abbreviated with the Greek letter lambda. that equals the wavelength. So these are some of the fundamental uh, terms you're going to need to, to know to understand uh, when we're talking about these various uh, things. So uh, some of the other things that we, we can talk about with waves, and I don't, I'm not going to uh, draw for you, uh, I wouldn't be able to do it anyway, uh, the entire electromagnetic spectrum. But as I said before, what you've got on one end the big wavelength and is what we refer to as radio waves. And these are multiple meters. I mean, they, they range from maybe a thousand meters down to something that's sub-meter in size. And then that uh, blend starts to blend into what we call the microwave region. And this might be around um, Oh, this would be less than a centimeter, probably. I don't remember exactly. You know, again, you have to find that in your book. Uh, then, from microwave, we go into the infrared, and the infrared is going to start at somewhere around maybe 700 nanometers, the wavelength, and that's going to go up to probably a couple thousand nanometers. Uh, and then uh, the infrared will then uh, below 700 nanometers, from maybe about 700 to about 400. That's the very small section of what we call the visible spectrum. This is the stuff that you can see with the naked eye. And then when we go below 400, down to maybe 200 or so, uh, we're in the uh, UV region of the spectrum, maybe even down to 100 uh, nanometers from uh, below 400, say 400 to approximately 100 nanometers. Again, you can get the actual numbers out of your, out of your text. Uh, this is the ultraviolet region, 
or U of V. So this is infrared. This is ultraviolet. And if we go even beyond the ultraviolet to shorter wavelengths, we're in the X-ray region. And finally, uh, below the X-ray, we have uh, gamma rays. This is the uh, Greek letter gamma. So, and that's the shortest wavelength. So we also have, in addition to the concept of wavelength, we have another concept that I should introduce, which is the concept of frequency. So if we plotted this with respect to time, this is time, and this might be the energy that we're experiencing here. Uh, so we're going from some, well, this is actually the zero point here. So this is the amplitude. We said this was amplitude. Now, for light waves, or waves that in the electromagnetic spectrum, um, these waves are what we call transverse waves. There's another kind of wave that's called a longitudinal wave. And for instance, that's the way that sound, sound moves. The wave is propagating in this direction. The wave is moving in this direction. But what's actually causing the disturbance is moving in the perpendicular direction. Something is vibrating, is moving up and down in this direction, and that's producing the wave. You can see that same phenomenon if you take a, um, for instance, if you were to take a, um, a rope and stretch a rope out, attach it at one end, and shake the rope up and down, you'll see this kind of wave being produced. You'll see this, uh, this uh, type of a sine wave being produced. But uh, unlike a, a rope, which is made out of material, which is made out of matter, electromagnetic radiation, and, and, and uh, doesn't need anything, it doesn't need to be attached to anything. It moves through the vacuum of space. It doesn't require uh, any kind of medium in which to propagate. Sound waves, which are actually uh, longitudinal waves, which involve compression and what we call rarefaction. It's molecules of gas being pushed together and then uh, pulling apart and being pushed together in another region. That's how sound, sound propagates. It has to go through a medium, whether it's a, a, a a gas or a, uh, a liquid or a solid, there must be some material present for it to propagate. But electromagnetic radiation, fortunately for us, uh, does not need a medium because if it did, uh, life would never have been able to uh, uh, exist on this planet because we would never be able to get the heat of the sun and all the light from the sun. It would not be able to travel through the vast emptiness of space between the sun and the earth. There would be no medium in, uh, in which it could propagate, but it doesn't require that medium. So that's the good news. Okay, so now uh, what we can do is we can look at this in another way. Uh, we can look at this in terms of the number of waves that we get per unit time. So let's say uh, if this is where we start, this is zero time, and uh, the point to here uh, represents uh, one second of time. then what we've got, we can count the number of waves that we've actually got in a one second period of time. So we've got one wave, two waves, three waves, four waves. So we would say that this has a frequency. In your book, this is abbreviated with the letter F. Uh, frequently you'll see the letter nu, the Greek letter nu, uh, also used to, uh, uh, for frequency. But uh, this has a frequency of four waves per second. Now we don't use, we don't say waves, we just say four per second. So we could write four over second, or we could write four second minus one. That's a reciprocal second, that's showing us uh, one over second. So this is four times one over second. Um, but this unit of one wave per second, or one over second, uh, is called the hertz. So we would say that this has a frequency of four hertz. And if you look at radio waves, for instance, uh, you'll find that radio waves, uh, you might be listening to an AM station, which broadcasts its signal in kilohertz, which is thousands of cycles per second. Um, or you might be looking at an FM station, which broadcasts its signal in megahertz, uh, something like, let's say, 780 megahertz, that's 780 million cycles per second. That's the number of uh, waves that we're actually getting in a one second period of time 
for these, uh, for these radio waves. So um, that uh, is frequency. Okay, so um, where this comes about, the, the way that these, uh, that these waves actually originate is because the waves originate because we have electrical fields, we have electrical charged electrical particles, hence the, uh, the name electromagnetic, because there's also, for every electrical field, there's also a corresponding magnetic field that's associated with that. So what we've got are charged particles. Let's say we put a proton somewhere in space. Uh, that proton, the field of that proton is going to propagate through space, something like this. It's not the way I'm drawing it, but you know, there, these, these field lines are everywhere. They are, there are essentially an infinite number of these field lines, and they're not going in a plane. They're going actually spherically, propagating through space. But let's say somewhere out here we have an electron. And the electron, which is the negatively charged particle, this is a proton here, and here we have our negative electron. And the electron is going to have field lines that would actually go into it like this. So it's really the field lines now are directed in the opposite sense. And we can imagine, therefore, that uh, an extension of the proton goes right into the electron. So this is the field between the uh, proton and the electron. Now, I could have drawn this the other way around. I could have put the electron over here and the proton over there, which actually probably would have made more sense because it's really the vibration or the movement of the protons, of, of, sorry, of the electrons that's producing. So that if the electron is moving up and down, if this thing is actually moving up and down, so it's got something like that, that's analogous to what I said before about the rope. Uh, if I take a rope here and I move the rope up and down, it produces a sine wave. And the electron moving up and down along this axis is going to produce a sine wave. And that wave is going to be that electromagnetic wave that we talked about. Now there are, uh, as I said before, for every um, uh, electrical field, there's also going to be a magnetic field. And the magnetic field is always uh, perpendicular to the electrical field. So that's why this is referred to as an electromagnetic wave, because in addition to the electrical component, there's also a magnetic component that moves in a perpendicular fashion. So let me see if I can try to draw this. And again, I'm not really good at this, but let's say this is the electrical field, and it looks sort of like this. Then there's going to be a magnetic field, and this is moving perfect in a perpendicular direction. So it's sort of going like this. It's a little hard to see that. But you have to imagine that this field is going like that. The other one, I'm trying to show it, it's coming out of the plane of the board. It's at 90 degrees uh, to this field. And that's the magnetic component of that. Um, so the electromagnetic spectrum actually extends so I can give you this from a great, something's greater than 10 to the fourth. I said 10 to the third, but it's like 10 to the fourth meters. This is about 10,000 meters uh, for a wavelength down to, um, so I'd say a little bit greater than this, down to uh, some slightly less than 10 to the minus 15th meters. So very, very small. And these correspond to frequencies of uh, less than 10 to the third hertz, that is cycles per second or waves per second, uh, to greater than 10 to the 23rd hertz. So that, that encompasses, this would be in the gamma region, and of course this would be in the far uh, radio region. And we're constantly being bombarded by all of this stuff uh, from, from space. So these waves, radio waves, uh, Microwaves, infrared waves, visible waves, uh, ultraviolet waves, X-rays, gamma, gamma radiation, all of this is coming uh, at us from, uh, from space all the time. Much of it doesn't get through our atmosphere. A great deal of it actually is absorbed or interacts with uh, molecules uh, or atoms.
atoms that happen to be in the atmosphere, and so we would never really see a lot of this stuff. But it, it turns out that um, there is there are some windows in our atmosphere. That is, there are certain areas that really uh, don't absorb very very well, and uh, we 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 consider this an area. We say that most uh, that our atmosphere is opaque to most electromagnetic uh, radiation, but there is a, there are some transparent areas. There are some areas where electromagnetic radiation gets in, and one of those is in the one centimeter to uh, approximately 10 centimeter region, and that's radio frequency. And also, uh, there's an optical window from about 400 nanometers to a, a little over uh, 10 microns, from about 400 nanometers, that would be in the uh, violet region of the spectrum, to about uh, 10 uh, microns, and that would actually uh, go a little bit into the, uh, uh, into the infrared uh, region of the spectrum as well. So um, it, it's the visible and part of the infrared that actually uh, is able to penetrate our atmosphere. Uh, okay, uh, another property that waves have is waves can be refracted or bent, and they also do something that's known as diffraction. Waves can also be diffracted. So I'll show you what a diffraction is, actually give you, uh, try to illustrate it on the board, and then show you an actual example of uh, diffraction using something called a diffraction grating, which is a way in which we can produce uh, spectral patterns, a way that we can analyze light uh, that uh, is coming from, uh, for instance, from stars. Uh, if we look at a wave, uh, remember I told you before that the waves have uh, what we call a crest and a trough. So the high point is the crest, and the low point is the trough. And another way of envisioning this is uh, imagine a wave front coming at you. Um, you know, basically these things are curved, but I'm going to show a very small part of it so that it actually uh, looks as though it's um, linear rather than, than curved. So we have a crest, which would be a bright area, and behind the crest there would be a dark area, which would be the trough, and then there'd be another bright area, and these things would alternate. Bright band, dark band, bright band, uh, another dark band here, and then another bright band in there. And uh, let's say that we actually have a slit out here uh, at some point right here. Uh, we've got a little slit. And the light can actually, this uh, wave of light can actually uh, pass through the slit. So what it does is it's going to pass through, uh, again, with these alternating light and dark bands. And it will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, uh, it's going to form a pattern that's going to be light and dark and light and dark, and you can actually project that, and you can get kind of a circular thing that looks sort of like this, where you'll have a light band, a dark band, a light band, a dark band, and you get a pattern that looks something like that. And that's because of the fact that when it passes through the slit, it's being diffracted, uh, causing this, uh, this uh, both this, this kind of curvature and actually producing these uh, light and dark uh, areas uh, on the other side of the slit as it passes through. Now, you can do this uh, with a laser. It's kind of neat to do this, and I'm going to show you this with a, um, I've got a small pen light laser here, and I also have a diffraction grating. Now, when I pass it through the diffraction grating, it's going to split this spot up into multiple spots in a particular kind of pattern. And this is from the uh, diffraction that's occurring. Let me see if I can show that to you. So you could probably see the diffraction pattern. Um, and the central spot, I can't keep the laser on and point to the spot at the same time. I wish I could, so I can, you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, well, maybe I can. Well, there's the central spot pointing at it uh, with my finger. It's the bright spot in the middle, if you can still see that. And then you'll see that there are uh, two spots to the left of that and two spots uh, to the right of that. So we call that a uh, uh, first, second order uh, diffraction pattern because we can go uh, two spots in any direction uh, and we can see that we can still see that pattern. With a more powerful light, which I have, I've actually been able to produce maybe uh, 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 um, an eightfold uh, uh, pattern using, using a, a diffraction grating. So that just illustrates the, uh, the concept of diffraction. And uh, another property that waves have is that they interfere with one another. So let's see if we can show that. So we can have a wave 
that's moving this way. And then we can have another wave that's coming this way. And they're both sine waves, but they're actually shifted uh, by uh, 90 degrees. And because of that, what happens is this actually cancels this out. This and this cancel out. This and this cancel out. Every point along here, if the amplitudes of these waves are exactly the same, but, the, but the, this is reversed and they're exactly aligned this way, what you would get from the combination of the two waves is basically a straight line. That is, you'd have no wave at all. So that's called a destructive interference, and waves can do that. And that's really what's happening um, with diffraction in the dark regions. That's where you see no light at all. That is a form of destructive interference. But where light wa uh, rays are coming in and they're interfering in a positive sense, so that would be something like we had the rays coming in like this, and then there's another one that looks like that. Now they're going to add up. So now we're going to get a new wave that's going to be it's going to have an amplitude that's going to be the sum of these two amplitudes and we'll get a wave that maybe will look like that so we'll get a much bigger wave now and that is constructive interference and that's going to give us our light band So it's just the fact that, that waves, um, and you can see this even with water waves, you can do the same kind of thing. You could actually set this up so that, and you can see that water waves will also interfere, even though these are material waves. Uh, they're still um, uh, uh, waves that have this, this particular kind of property. That, that, that is, they, they show both uh, destructive and constructive uh, interference. Uh, another property of, uh, uh, of, of light is something that we refer to as black body radiation. So that's the next thing that I want to talk about.